may come on. Um, so again, thank you everyone uh, for joining us tonight. My name is Melissa. I work at the Village Learning Place and you are at our second Wednesday program. Um, if you don't know the Village Learning Place, we're a nonprofit library with programs like this for everyone from toddlers to seniors um, located in the Charles Village neighborhood. This program, Second Wednesdays, is a free monthly cultural series um, featuring lectures and special arts events. It is coordinated by a very dedicated volunteer committee, uh, so we always want to say thank you to them. Um, and it's all of our programs, including this one, are made possible by donations because we are a nonprofit. Um, so yeah, we have longtime supporters of this program who come frequently and donate. So if you feel moved to to donate um, tonight or at any point, I'll put the link in the chat box and you can always visit our website, uh, villagelearningplace.org. This has in the past taken place in our library building. Um, we're gonna be virtual until further notice. Um, actually, this is the, the one year anniversary, March, 2020 was the last one, um, or the first one we were, had to transition to online. Um, so as of right now, they're going to be virtual just to keep everybody safe, but keep checking online for more updates about upcoming programs. We're in the process of finalizing some of the upcoming months. Um, so the links to view those and updates about the program in general. Um, I also want to let you know we have some other fun events coming up. On March 25th, we have a fundraiser. Um, it's a Thursday evening. It's in the collaboration with a Baltimore Spirits Company. One of their bartender mixologists is going to be teaching our crowd how to make craft cocktails at home. So um, that is a fundraiser. So tickets start at $25 for that and they come with all the ingredients. You can either pick them up or get them delivered to your home so that you can do, take part in the hands-on cocktail making at home that evening. We also have a cake and pastry auction that'll be coming up in April. Right now we're just looking for volunteer bakers. So if you know anyone or if you really like to bake, um, kind of like a modern take on an old fashioned bake sale and all of that'll take place online as well. Um, so we are still trying to bring people together and raise money, but also keep people safe um, by making it all virtual. Um, and that brings us back to this evening. Um, so tonight we have Lady Brian with us. Um, she is an international spoken word artist, poetry coach, activist, organizer, educator, and the executive director of the Pennsylvania Avenue Black Arts and Entertainment District. Um, she received her Bachelor of Arts in Applied Communication from Howard University. She also has an MFA in Creative Writing and Publishing Design from the University of Baltimore. Um, she has won several titles during her slam poetry career, including the 2016 National Poetry Slam, on the Southern Fried Regional Slam in 2017 and 2019. Um, and me, most recently, she was ranked third in the Women of the World Poetry Slam in March 2020. Um, she also serves on the board for Do More Baltimore and is the cultural curator for a grassroots political think tank called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle in Baltimore. I'm sure she'll tell you more about all of this stuff tonight. Um, and if you do have any questions throughout the course of her presentation, I ask that you either type them in the chat box or hold them till the end. Um, and she might have some time for a Q and A. Um, and if you can be mindful, just keep yourself muted so that we can hear uh, everything that she has to say. Uh, and that is everything I have to say. I will pass it off to Lady Brian now and she can take over from there. she is. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. So um, I am Lady Brion. Yep, that is me. Uh, thank you all for having me this evening. Um, I am having some technical difficulties. I had a presentation that I put together, um, but it now won't open. <laughs> So um, what I think I might do is share an old presentation and just use that as some talking points. But unfortunately, it will not be all the things that I was going to share because that presentation, it won't open. So we're just going to, you know, roll with the punches. I feel like during the uh, era of COVID um, and all things technology just go wrong because technology is trolling us. So we're just going to 
roll with the punches. Okay, so to begin, before I share my presentation, um, I want to share a poem that I wrote uh, for the Black Arts District that is going to be as a part of a commercial that we're going to put out um, hopefully this year, um, and then I'll go ahead and share, uh, like I said, an old um, presentation, but it will still serve as just some visuals for, um, for the conversation. So we're going to start with this poem. Um, it doesn't have a title, but <laughs> here we go. This be a migration home to a place where saxophone tongues sing the blues, where the sky is made of jazz so it rains in improv, where club mixes bellow from turntables to speakers making legs go crazy in exuberance. As we dance our pain away, this is where music is made, where drums pulsate open palms slap sound loose from gym bays, hands uplifted like praise, bodies patterned after joy, smiles on face. We a people darker than blue, bleed purple in Oreo hues, souls kaleidoscope dope, spirits dipped in gold so we feel in color. We sphinx, Linux and royal, a legacy etched in our essence. We shake and bake, we roller skate and bounce back from the stress of our schedules home where memories are etched into murals and love pours like paint on canvas the avenue where even our attitudes are beautiful like a mosaic of resilience we textured and gritty we be history living in the present arch social club type of relic over 100 years distinguished where the leaders of men could chop it up like kinfolk a toast may the jazz bands never stop playing we the home of freddie gray and the place where his body was laid, the groundwork for an uprising, we spirits rising, homage to ancestors, may their wisdom be our guidance, Ethel Waters, UB Blake, Chick Webb and Cab Calloway, Billy Holiday to the ancestors of today, Scooter became an idol for a generation, I say this be a migration home, back to the authentic. You can feel it in the streets, the concrete christened this culture, a city baptized in a cornucopia of melanated magnificence. We, the future's image, picture perfect even in our imperfection. This still life celebrates the fact that we are still alive. We, poets, making monuments of microphones. We speak into existence, consecrating an arts community, main family, we be the Black Arts District, which means we be bad. We so bad, we good. All right, so that was a poem. Now I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and see. All right. Okay. Can you all see this? Oops, sorry. See this screen? Yes? Yes, I can see it. All right. Great. All right. So don't pay any attention that it says year in review community meeting. This is absolutely created just for y'all for today. Okay. This is not an old presentation. <laughs> Um, but uh, so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we got to this point um, for the Black Arts District, so our origin story. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about what we have been able to do in our short existence, and then talk a little bit about um, some plans that we have for the future. And then I'll open up for any questions um, that folks might have. So um, I guess to talk a little bit about, let's see, what do I have here? Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about our origin story. So in 2018, uh, I was asked to join um, what was then called the Task Force for Safe Arts under the Pew Administration. And the idea for that task force was really um, to talk about how to make uh, you know, DYI art spaces safer in Baltimore City because there was a fire um, in a place called the Ghost Ship out in uh, California. And it made mayors across the United States think about how do we make sure we don't have a situation like the ghost ship, which, you know, injured a lot of artists who were living in that building, right, happen in our city. So uh, we created that in Baltimore. And unfortunately, you know, although Baltimore is a predominantly Black city and has a lot of DYI spaces that are um, utilized by Black artists, I was one of two. Um, uh, community. Actually, I was the only Black community artist on that 
uh, task force. And I mean, it might have been 40 people on this task force. Um, and I was the only, you know, Baltimore raised black artist on, on the on, on the task force. And so one of the things that I brought up is that if we really want to make sure we're servicing black artists in the city, um, I think that we should have an arts district that is dedicated to black creatives. And I mentioned Pennsylvania Avenue as a place that made sense for it. Um, it was a conversation that was kind of brushed off as something that was symbolic, but that recommendation made it to the official recommendations for Baltimore City at the time as it related to the arts community. And that's really all I needed. I took that, I took that press conference that we had with the mayor where there was some enthusiasm um, shared around it from the mayor's cabinet. And I had a community meeting uh, maybe a month or two after that and I had about 100 to 150 people show up to talk about this potential for the Black Arts District back in 2018. I then started meeting with community organizations in West Baltimore and residents kind of pitching this dream of an arts and entertainment district and there was so much excitement around it primarily because um this was not the first iteration of people working to create an arts and entertainment district. There were many grassroots movements trying to create some kind of cultural district. There was also one legislative attempt to create what was called an arts business, business and cultural district, all of which were not successful. Um, I think the difference with this movement is one, the coalition that was put together um, to support this effort, which included organizations like the Arts Social Club, the Avenue Bakery, which are stakeholders um, within the Black Arts District. We had, you know, Drew Heights CDC and the Upton Planning Committee and their West Side CDC. So we had community development corporations a part of it. We had residents a part of it. We had artists a part of it. Um, so this coalition, I think, was a really tight knit group um, that helped to support the effort. And also, this was the first time that an a group went through a state mandated process, right? To create a cultural district through the Maryland State Arts Council, which is an organization under the Department of Commerce. And they actually back in 2000 created an arts and entertainment district program that has produced 29 arts and entertainment district all across the state of Maryland. And so we decided to go through that process, which is a very lengthy, um, you know, tedious process um, in which we had to do a lot of organizing to submit that process that included getting um, almost 5,000 signatures on our petition. We did a lot of community engagement, um, visioning sessions, story circles, uh, you know, a lot of letters of support. And we put together a, a really thorough application that was like, you know, 40 pages long, plus maybe 100 additional pages of attachments. And we applied to the city and we were granted in 2019, uh, July, as the first and only arts and entertainment district in the state of Maryland that is uniquely dedicated to the celebration, support, um, and promotion, particularly of Black creatives uh, in our state. And so we're really excited about that accomplishment, really excited that we were able to make that happen. Um, and so we officially became a nonprofit in uh, January 2020. So a little bit about our organizational structure. Again, you know, this was our community uh, meeting. So it's a lot of information that y'all probably don't need. But for us, we put community at the top. Most organizations look at their board of directors at the top. But for us, we are intentionally a community centered organization. And a part of that is because we recognize that arts communities can often be the purveyors of gentrification, can often be the first wave of, you know, erasing um, the, the culture and history of a community in order to kind of bolster or revitalize that community and bring in a whole new suite of businesses and services and white corporate dollars um, that is not true to community. So in order for us to stave off the effects of gentrification and make sure we're aligned with the history of Pennsylvania Avenue, which is rich and beautiful, and we can talk a little bit about that, we make sure that community is at the top of everything that we do. We, we also have a 10-member uh, board of directors. I am the executive director, um, we, and we have a full-time administrative assistant. We have an intern program and a program manager, program coordinator. So that's our small little structure right now. Um, the district boundaries, uh, and this is a map of our district and some of our stakeholder uh, anchor institutions, but the district primarily runs along the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor, 
Um, the top of the district is Fulton Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue. The south of the district is Dolphin Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. Our westernmost boundary is Fremont Street and our easternmost boundary is McCullough Street. Our district in total is 149 acre stretch in West Baltimore and the communities uh, that uh, our district consists of is the Penn North community, Druid Heights community, the Upton community, and a little slither of the Sandtown Winchester community. Um, and so I want to I want to uh, take a step back, and we'll get to this in a second, uh, but talk a little bit about the history um, on Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm sure many of you know it better than I do, uh, but for you know a lot of people, when we think about arts and culture as it relates to, you know, Black folks and Black creatives in this city, Pennsylvania Avenue is the place that will always come up, always be named, because it was a hub for high quality arts, entertainment, um, shopping, etc. for the Black community um, in Baltimore. We're talking about the 40s, 50s, and 60s. This was the place to go, right? Um, Pennsylvania Avenue at one point had over 30 different um, clubs and theaters and etc. Um, all supporting arts and culture. The Royal Theater was a stop on the Chitlin Circuit, which was a circuit of uh, of theaters that were amenable to black performers at a time when you know segregation made it so that black performers could not perform in a number of places around the country. So you know you have the Apollo Theater in New York, you have the Howard Theater in DC, and you have the Royal Theater in Baltimore, as well as many others, um, especially you know around the United States, right? Um, Pennsylvania Avenue was also home to the first black owned movie house right on Penn and North Avenue. The Arch Social Club uh, was one of those venues as well that is actually still standing um, at, at over a hundred years old in their history as one of the longest standing black male social clubs in all of the United States. Um, you know, you had the, the first black owned medical center that was just blocks away from Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and, and you know, the, the community surrounding Pennsylvania Avenue, again, was home to so many folks like Billie Holiday, uh, Cab Calloway's family, uh, Thurgood Marshall, and the list goes on. And so, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue really represented the full stratum of uh, black folks in this country from your menial workers all the way up to, you know, your doctors, your lawyers, your performing artists, etc. could all be found on or around Pennsylvania Avenue. And so what better place, right, to create a cultural district, an arts and culture district, right, other than Pennsylvania Avenue to honor that legacy. Um, uh, and again, a lot of those places are no longer in existence, but some of them are still standing and there are new uh, uh, arts and cultural venues that exist on Pennsylvania Avenue that we want to honor. So if we go back to this map, I didn't mention, but like I said, we have Art Social Club, we have the Avenue Bakery, which does a jazz series um, in the summer months every year in their courtyard. We have the Avenue Market, which is a part of the city's market system. So Lexington Market and Holland's Market and um, uh, what is the market that's on um, that is in Fells Point? I don't know, but that market, <laughs> there are Broadway? no, Broadway, there we go. I was like, what is that street? Yes, Broadway market. These are all a part of uh, the city's market system and uh, Pennsylvania Avenue has one. It's called the Avenue Market now. It started out as Lafayette Market, but after a fire, um, that building was renamed and rededicated and redesigned to have a more Afrocentric look. So that's what it looks like now, the Avenue Market. And they also do, you know, arts and culture-based programming. You also have the Shake and Bake Family Fun Center, which um, some of you may know was actually built and dedicated by uh, Glenn Dowdy, who used to be a football player um, uh, on the Baltimore Colts. And he really wanted to create something that traditionally didn't exist, right? Having um, cultural, like family fun, cultural centers that actually existed within like black neighborhoods, right? That was not a thing at the time when Shake and Bake was built. Um, and so he dedicated that on Pennsylvania Avenue. It then got a complete uh, overhaul, I want to say two years ago or three years ago now by the city of Baltimore and is now actually a city-owned uh, build building by uh, Rex and Parks. And so it's a beautiful building um, inside and out. And so uh, we love Shake and Bake. You have the Billy Holiday statue. You also have the Upton Boxing Center, which is also owned by Rex and Parks. Um, so yeah, these are these are some of the sites that currently exist on Pennsylvania Avenue. Did I miss any? Let me see. 
Uh, okay. All right. So again, um, you know, that's really the history of Pennsylvania Avenue. The other thing that I will note is, you know, um, when we think about Baltimore as a city, right? Um, and we think about that time period, especially when we're, when uh, Pennsylvania Avenue was at its height, right, in its heyday. Um, there was also a movement uh, in Baltimore City um, that I think negatively affected the trajectory of Pennsylvania Avenue and also, you know, really makes this a question of equity, why the Black Arts District needs to exist, right? So you, you have a portion in Baltimore's history where uh, we experience what was uh, called white flight and the Black following, right? And so you have this whole sort of migration of folks out of Baltimore to the suburbs, right? Um, and it, it, it drastically impacted, uh, you know, Baltimore City, the revenue that I was able to draw, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the city's response, uh, what, what was the predecessor of the current Baltimore Development Corporation, um, they decided to sort of start building out uh, what is now downtown Baltimore, starting with uh, uh, one Charles Street, so that Charles Center building, and then moving to what is now known as the Inner Harbor and Harbor East, right? And so they basically put together a 50-year plan, right? I think it was between a 50 and 80-year plan um, to build out what is now our Inner Harbor. And um, as a part of that plan, what was interesting to me, I, I read that they said they wanted to have a, uh, a city center that rivaled like, you know, the likes of, uh, you know, amusement parks, you know, around the, around the country. And what was interesting is when they built out our inner harbor, uh, the statistics show that we had more visitors in the Baltimore Inner Harbor than Disney World that year. So the plan essentially worked, right? Uh, they built out that promenade and a lot of the businesses around it. But what happened was that it traded off with other commercial corridors in the city like Pennsylvania Avenue because the city had to make a decision. If you're gonna build your convention center downtown, if you're gonna build your visitor center downtown, if you're gonna build all of these attractions, then you can't have you know, high quality performers coming and performing somewhere other than in your downtown venues. And so essentially the Royal Theater was actually torn down in a back office deal uh, between you know, the city of Baltimore so that we could get these performers to actually perform in the downtown venues, right? Um, and and so we see that, you know, decisions by the city, as well as the riots of 68 and subsequent decline really all impacted um, the, the, you know, sustainability of the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. And since that time, it has just experienced consistent neglect. And now you have uh, the corridor as it stands now that needs a lot of work to, to really be able to revive the vision um, and the legacy of what Pennsylvania Avenue used to be. And so that is really a part of why we exist and what we wanna do in addition to supporting um, creatives, we have a new vision for Pennsylvania Avenue. So this is our mission statement to continue the revitalization efforts of West Baltimore through culture, art, and entertainment. Our vision statement is that the Pennsylvania Avenue Black Arts and Entertainment District is the choice destination for high quality arts, culture, food, and entertainment in Baltimore. Our rich culture and legacy of community building and Black autonomy continues to enhance cultural production, historic preservation, and social development. Our work is centered in love, unity, shared purpose, and respect for our people. So again, you have your Chinatowns of, your, of the world, your little Italy's of the world. We want to be the place that folks will go to engage with uh, African-American culture, entertainment, arts, uh, and history, right, in Baltimore City. All right, so let's keep it going. All right, so our focus areas for um, our organization, sorry, I need to change the view here. I can't actually see my whole screen but I don't know how to do that. Oh, there we go. All right. 
So uh, the focus areas for our organization include events and activities. And this is really about curating and promoting experiences that encourage creativity, connection, and celebration. And so, you know, from our festivals to our fairs to our uh, open mics, performing artists events, right? That's really what those are catered towards. We also focus on training and development. And this is really about supporting local creators, um, creative enterprises, institutions, et cetera, to achieve their economic and creative potential, whatever that looks like for folks. We are also really interested in advocacy and education as it relates to cultural, culture, arts, and entertainment, right? So this means championing policies, legislation, practices, laws, et cetera, that will lead to a more informed, empowered, and culturally equitable Baltimore. Because again, when we think about it, the reason why a Black Arts District needs to exist is because, you know, Baltimore City, home of redlining, home of a number of policies that have negatively impacted Black communities in general, and the arts community is no different. So when we are thinking about having conversations about supporting the, the Black community and the Black arts community, then there has to be some education and advocacy involved to make sure that we are using an equitable lens to benefit artists and creatives um, that are Black in the city. Lastly, creative placemaking. So this is really about using art and culture to help shape the physical and social environment uh, in West Baltimore, especially along the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. All right. Now, these are just some benchmarks, some things that we have successfully done up until this point, right? And so we have become an independent nonprofit um, with 501c3 status, but we are also fiscally sponsored by Drew at High CDC, which is a partner that was a part of our uh, coalition. We are, you know, fiscally sponsored by them simply to be able to be able to uh, receive community development dollars um, as some of the work that we're doing is, you know, based in building new sites or supporting, um, you know, community development. And so we have a sort of hybrid model, but we are a standalone 501c3 as well. We were able to launch our brand identity. So I'm sure that you've noticed the, the branding on every slide. I'm really excited about that. Um, we, it says here, um, you, you see a red dot that we haven't done our strategic plan, but we actually just launched our strategic plan, plan, planning process and will be done before the close of this year. Uh, we're still looking to launch advisory committees that will be standing alongside our board of directors, again, to make sure community consistently is involved in our process. Um, but we have established our board of directors and, um, you know, raised some capital to support the organization. Uh, we've hosted a number of cultural events, um, developed our marketing plan. We have a website and social media that I'll definitely share with you all. Um, we actually just moved into an office space, so that will be green now. Um, and we uh, have, you know, developed systems within the organization that we're excited um, to support us as a standalone nonprofit. All right. So I'm going to skip. So I guess I'll, I'll share, um, these are just some goals that we had uh, over the last year. This is for 2020, which was really about um, launching a creative placemaking project that celebrates the vibrant culture in West Baltimore and increases visitorship. And so the two activities that are connected to that is our vertical pole banner uh, project and the historical photography project. The vertical pole banner project was really just about hanging vertical pole banners that brand the district so that people can see, um, you know, that we are a new art district and be able to identify uh, when they are in that space. The historical photography project I'll talk about in just a second. Um, also, we've done a number of activities um, in 2020 specifically to provide resources and support for Black creatives during the COVID-19 crisis. So we gave about $10,000 in direct support to Black creatives um, over the 2020 year. We also worked with uh, BOPA, which is the Baltimore Office of Promotion and Arts, to create an artist relief fund that gave about 300 micro grants to artists across Baltimore City. We also held art competitions, which was another way for us to pay artists for being artists during COVID-19. Um, and we did a mini make concert series, which again, we just wanted to give people something other we wanted to, excuse me, give people something to think about other than COVID-19. And so we tried to, you know, put on some concerts and do things that just help people to, to come together virtually and, and celebrate the, the, the life that we have. Um, and also to just celebrate Black artists in the city. 
Um, and we also sponsored some open mics because they were still creating community, even if it was virtually during the time where people felt so disconnected. So we sponsored five different open mics as well um, in 2020. Um, so yeah, I guess I can share. Uh, last year, our income um, was around um, $132 thousand um, dollars that is actually reduced from what it was intended to be because we lost a lot of funding because a lot of funders started to redirect redirect funding due to COVID-19 and so we had to shift some things around but um, this is pretty much a snapshot of our income and our expenses from last year. Um, okay so plans for 2021 the historical photography project I mentioned I would talk a little bit about that it is a photo, photo banner based creative placemaking initiative, which is being piloted in West Baltimore. We actually adopted this from a community in San Antonio um, with support from the T. Rowe Price Foundation. The purpose of this project is to preserve culture through storytelling and celebrating people in places of West Baltimore, not just your famous folks like Cab Calloway and Billie Holiday, but your everyday folks like the guy who owned a cleaner for 25 years or, you know, the guy who opened the first bakery on Pennsylvania Avenue or, you know, the woman who cleaned her marble steps every Sunday and brought in kids from the community just to, you know, provide guidance and support. I don't know, but all kinds of stories about all kinds of people, right? Um, we're also going to be doing the Black Artist Fair actually this April. That should say the 30th, not the 31st, it's actually a typo, but it's going to be the 30th through May 2nd. And it is going to be an virtual experience that is designed to be an educational and interactive event um, to connect local Black artists to resources and services that can further enhance their crafts and careers and help to, you know, monetize their creative practice. So this is going to have clinical. So if you need legal services, tax services, you need work on your business plan, if you need work on creating an artist's resume, if you need photos like headshots or product shots, um, if you want to take master classes in different art forms, um, we have keynotes um, that are going to be from, you know, some, some celebrities that we have coming. We have panels that are going to be from members of all different industries and creative communities in Baltimore. It is going to be a dynamic, great time. We're also going to have some artistic performances as well. And so we're super excited to do that. It's going to be completely free to the public and we're going to be doing it every year. Uh, and I also, I mentioned the strategic plan and uh, vertical pole banner project already. Last but not least, um, we are looking to launch our first capital campaign to build a ground up development on Pennsylvania Avenue. So this is a 3D basic site plan for uh, what we're looking to do. So it is going to be called the Sanaa Center. Um, the Sanaa is a word that means art in the East African language, Kiswahili. It's proposed to be, again, a ground up development on Pennsylvania Avenue designed to be a Black arts incubator space that will provide uh, private co-working shared and performance spaces in addition to professional um, and creative business development services as well as startup incubation services. The Sanaa Center's primary role is to provide resources and networking opportunities as well as training and development which is one of our focus areas to burgeoning and practicing creatives in Baltimore, right? We'll also have rental spaces, rehearsal spaces, and medium-sized performance spaces both indoor and outdoor on um, this site. And ultimately, it's really intended to just bolster the economic stability and prosperity of the creative community. And if you think about like workforce development, that's honestly what this is intended to be, but for the creative sector, because oftentimes workforce development does not include the creative sector at all. And so we're looking to support them through this through this building. And so really quickly, the number five is a pre-existing building called the Harris Market Center, um, which a partner of ours, Intersection of Change, currently runs. Number four is going to be an expansion to their site. Uh, number three is actually a parking lot and courtyard. Number six is a arts-based alley art, way, art walk, excuse me. And then number two would be the actual Sanaa Center, um, which, you know, is going to be an amazing addition that can tether us and anchor us in the Black Arts District. And where you see number one, that is the pre-existing Upton Boxing Center that we talked about before. Um, and then this is a current 
uh, aerial view of that site now. So you can see again on the Pressman side, that is the pre-existing Harris Marcus Center. Um, and that open vacant lot is where we are proposing to build the Sanaa Center. And again, what you see on the other side is the Upton Boxing Center. All right, so that is the end of this presentation. I apologize that I don't have contact information, but I will put it in the chat if anybody is interested. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was a lot. I know I was kind of woo, but uh, hopefully <laughs> y'all learned some new things about us. And I am, again, open to any questions or comments people might have while I type some contact information in the chat. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. No, it was wonderful. Um, and I'm happy we were able to see, being able to see the, the presentation, even though I know it was an older one, um, it was good to see some of the pictures and the diagrams and stuff um, of everything coming in the future. Um, but yeah, if people want to, un you can unmute and ask questions, or if you're having trouble with that, or you prefer, you can type it in the chat um, and I can I can make sure that your question gets heard. Um, okay, so Janet wants to know about the background image from the mission slide. From the mission slide, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a still shot from our commercial um, and it was a picture of Ernest Shaw, who is a pretty well-known muralist in Baltimore City. Um, so that was Ernest Shaw pretending to paint a picture that was actually already finished for the purposes of the commercial. Um, <laughs> uh, we were at, at the Motor House and he was, you know, a featured artist in the commercial. Um, fun fact, Ernest Shaw was actually my art teacher in high school. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where will the historical photography project be accessed or distributed? You know, in in what form? Because it sounded like it was photographs as well as uh, what recordings of storytelling. Yeah. So it is interesting because this thing is evolving. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to talk about it in, let's see, four parts. Okay, so one, there will be actual installations um, on Pennsylvania Avenue. The sites have not been determined yet because we're actually going to hold a series of community conversations to have community identify where they would like to see these installations. So they may all be in one space or they may be spread right across Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and so they may be on buildings, on fences, in vacant lots. We haven't determined exactly where the photos will be, but they will be like larger than life size installations, right? Um, and then secondly, uh, we are going to incorporate them in the vertical pole banners because those have not been installed yet because the office is closed due to COVID. So we decided to also add some of some images um, one side will be our branding and the other side will be photos that we are gathering from community or some historical societies in, in Baltimore, um, about West Baltimore, right? Um, three, we are actually building a website and this website is going to be designed to capture both images that people want to submit that may not ever make it to a photo banner or installation, but we still want to like like uh, document all of these photos about old West Baltimore. And it will be a place where people can upload physically on the site. Like all you have to do is log onto the site, push record, and you can tell your story about, you know, who you are or your family or whoever, because we recognize that there's so much history that has never been collected about West Baltimore. Um, and we want to use this as an opportunity to learn about especially old West Baltimore um, and the Black folks who, you know, made it what it is. And so this site will be an archive for images and videos and interviews interviews that are going to be attached to um, the historic photography project. Two more things. We're also planning to install some uh, historic plant plaques to mark some of the sites that are no longer there. Um, like, a, you know, a good example is the Sphinx Club that I named in my poem. 
used to be a place that so many people frequented, but that site is no longer there, but it would be great to have a historic plaque to mark that site as you know you see in a lot of historic communities across the nation. Lastly, we are also developing a curriculum and toolkit that we're going to be given to schools so that uh, young people and students can learn about West Baltimore through this historic photography project. So many parts, all the things, many ways to engage. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'll ask another. Is there, you know, how Philip Merrill just published the Old West Baltimore book? Is he, yes. are you guys working together? So Philip Merrill is actually, uh, him and his daughter are uh, our research team for this project, mainly because he just published a book uh, <laughs> that uh, has a lot of research that we think should be tied to this project. He's also going to help us conduct some new research for things that uh, isn't covered in, in his work, but that we want to be covered with this project. So absolutely. <laughs> him and Webster Philip, who... Uh, um, uh, has, um, well, through his father and his own collection, a number of photos of like old West Baltimore history. So, yes. And Melissa, <laughs> that's the key for you to say. I was just gonna say, yeah, actually next Thursday, a partner organization of ours, the Baltimore City Historical Society has a Zoom program and um, oh, Philip Webster, is that who it is? Do it is doing the photography of le, it's like the Webster family, like three generations of photographer, like Baltimore through the eyes of three generations of photographers. So uh, yeah. if you're interested, um, you can join that one at 7 p.m. next Thursday on um, the links on our website. And yeah, so what a wonderful, I mean, Baltimore for you, yeah. small, very interconnected community, but love that. Yeah. Where exactly will the April fair be located? It's actually going to be virtual. Oh, virtual. Um, that's right. Yeah, because we don't, you know, we don't want to put anybody at risk and, you know, we want to make sure as many people can participate as possible. The only thing that's going to be in person are the photo shoots, but it'll be, you know, one person at a time in a secure location, um, but everything else will be virtual. Yeah. And so we're wait for it to be in person. It's going to be so exciting. I know. It sounds so colorful. <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yeah. Next year. Next year. Next year, that's our hope and our prayer. Yeah, that's great. How about, um, you know, the Peel Center's work on collecting, or are you tying into that too? So um, they are definitely a model that we are looking at um, because I, uh, yeah, I did an event, oh, this was years ago now, um, when they were at the Peel Museum, when they were first starting to collect those stories. And so I'm very familiar with the platform. And so it is a model that we're looking at. Um, we do want to make sure that, because I know that their stories don't necessarily have like a specific geographic location in Baltimore, but for us, we want to, we're trying to make sure that like, we're tying them to West Baltimore. So for the ones that can apply, I think maybe we'll have some way to tie in with them, but we're definitely using it as a model. Okay, I'm gonna send you um, another model. Okay, <laughs> please do, yeah, please do. Uh, okay, so we got a question come through on the chat. Uh, forgive my coming here late. Are you connecting with Baltimore Heritage, Heritage at all? And tell me more on other local connections you're making, or maybe not local, yeah. any connections you're making. So Baltimore Heritage is actually another research partner of ours <laughs> because um, they, you know, just kind of happenstance, I guess, um, got a grant to do a uh, research project specifically about, um, uh, I guess, Civil rights, civil, excuse me, civil rights um, history in West Baltimore. And they were also uh, doing research about uh, certain cultural sites in West Baltimore. And so we figured that fits perfectly in with our um, historical photography project in some ways. So we're working with them uh, as, a, as a partner on the project. Interestingly enough, we're also working with the Historic Society too. Um, so all, all the people were all like one big team on this. So yeah. And the second part of it, more about other connections you're making. Um, well, we, I mean, we have a committee that, uh, you know, Baltimore Office of Promotion of Arts is on. Uh, Jubilee Arts is an organization that is a part of it. Um, 
different stakeholders in the community and community residents are a part of that committee. Uh, as again, T. Rowe Price uh, is our funder, but they're also on the committee. Um, I'm missing other folks. There are two. Um, Yeah, I'm missing some folks off the top of my head, but yeah, we have a whole whole group of um, organizations and folks that are helping us to make sure we roll out this project in a way that is meaningful. Okay, gotcha. So do we partner with other arts and entertainment districts? So, you know, arts and entertainment districts um, in other parts of the state, there was typically only one in each municipality. Baltimore, because we were the flagship city, has four. <laughs> and so we have, um, as of last year, um, created sort of our own little, uh, not coalition, but we meet on a monthly basis to make sure that we are supporting each other as districts and try to do cross promotion, cross program, et cetera. Um, so that's a very new thing so that we're not operating in silos. So the answer is yes, I'm consistently working with the other arts districts in Baltimore. There are three other ones for those of you who don't know, um, Station North, Highland Town and Bromo. And um, do we partner with Promise Heights? We do not have a um, specific connection at this time with Promise Heights, but, um, you know, we do, we are aware of Promise Heights and their work, but we don't have a direct connection with them right now. No. Can you speak now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, there was an article in the paper, uh, I think last weekend, about a guy who is uh, going to develop a um, redevelop a neighborhood in West Baltimore. I can't remember the name of it. It's a familiar neighborhood. But his he's with a nonprofit and his uh, idea was that the article was focusing on that he was going to give people a chance to buy into this. And he thought he'd maybe get at like $1,200 of whack. He'd get maybe $150,000. And I think he ended up getting 300000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that was the focus of the article that a lot of people or it, it's not Walbrook Junction, or, or maybe it is. But anyway, do you are you familiar with any of that? I'm not aware of the article that you are referring to, but I'm interested to look it up. Um, I, I may, I may know. I don't off the top of my head know. But um, it, it is also a model that we're interested in using for the Sana Center. We want right. to make sure that we're also giving people an opportunity um, because this is for the community. Like we want to, you know, allow people to you know, donate if they want to. And we're gonna have a wall dedicated to all the folks who donated to the project so they can be honored for their donation and literally uh, building this community center. So we, we are looking to kind of launch a similar kind of effort for the Sanat Center. It was exciting to hear because he was taking it on himself rather than it being a community effort. But gotcha. then he was opening it up and he was just amazed at the um, interest he got. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. No, I'm not. not sure. It's from the Sun paper in the, within the last week or so. Okay, gotcha. All right. Any other questions? Thank you for your questions. Um, I think it looks like, yeah, it looks, sounds like we everyone, everyone got their questions answered. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say before we sign off? Um. Oh, okay. That's not about me. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. No. Nope. Well, you already, gonna... yeah, put the, you put the website and the social media handles mm -hmm. uh, in the chat. So everyone, yeah, just follow along with their, all their future endeavors. Stay Yeah, stay and updated. if you need to connect with us, I also put an email there too, um, which is our admin and um, whoever is the best recipient for that email, she'll send it, she'll send it to that person. Um, yeah. So, I, I do have a question. Is it possible still to do it? Yep. Okay. Uh, you know, the elephant in the room is security. All of us think, how could you go over there? So any thoughts about that? Sure. Um, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, I'll, I'll answer it a few ways. Um, first and foremost, I think that when we talk about, uh, you know, crime, especially as it relates to, um, you know, drugs or theft or et cetera, um, 
a lot of that stems from folks not having education, resources, jobs, opportunities. Um, and so it only heightens the issue when those communities are consistently neglected, underdeveloped, disenfranchised, et cetera. So my perception is when you build out these communities and provide more opportunities, it actually will have a positive impact on drug and crime usage rather than, you know, make that space, you know, not safe for the new businesses that are coming in. Also, when you look at the highest crime rates in the city, believe it or not, oftentimes they surround downtown and the business corridor because naturally when people are going to steal and people are going to rob, they go to places that are vibrant. <laughs> and so I say that to say, Crime that may happen on Pennsylvania Avenue is the same as it would happen on any business corridor because when people are, you know, don't have a way to get what they need, that's that's what they, you know, that's that's what they will resort to. And I'm not um, condoning this, but what I am saying is there's a reasonable expectation that we will need security, but that is un that is the same and not unique to any part of Baltimore right? It, it will happen. Um, I'll, uh, the last thing I'll say is um, I, for myself, take a position that I'm not going to um, pathologize West Baltimore in such a way to use the negative um, and the negative stigma that it has as a reason not to develop or bring new, um, you know, businesses and opportunity in West Baltimore. Is there, are there issues currently? Yes, that's true all across Baltimore. Does this community deserve opportunities? Yes. And so we have to figure out a way to both um, develop a plan to, to address issues that exist while also developing a plan to revitalize the community. And so I choose to take a positive perspective and outlook um, and work with the resources that are available, work with uh, the police department, and also work with community organizations that are helping with, with crime and drug addiction and et cetera to better the whole of the community um, as best we can. And over time, I think that we will see um, a change in that area. And the best example that I always use is like 36th Street in Hamden, which years ago was a lot like what people currently do would describe Pennsylvania Avenue as, but they became a main street. They developed a plan and a marketing strategy. And now you go to 36th Street and you wouldn't believe the way that it used to be years ago. And I have that same hope and dream uh, for Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Good. an amazing sentiment um, and a good approach. Um, and yeah. I don't want to say anything because I think you said it perfectly. <laughs> um, it was fantastic. It was very yeah, thank you so much for joining thank us. You very much. Very <laughs> um, yeah, we want to hear more. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, we have. I mean, we have a newsletter that we send out monthly. Um, and so, if you'd like to join our newsletter, um, you can just go to the website and click subscribe. Or if you're on social media, you can click subscribe on our social media, um, so that you can, you know, stay abreast of what's happening. And I appreciate you all. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Everyone, stay connected. Um, and we'll keep in touch and um, keep learning and keep sharing. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Very interesting. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Be safe. Bye. Be well. Um,